We're continuing with uh, Basha's introduction. Introduction. That's the starting thing. How's the, the video starting? Okay, so we're continuing with the introduction to Basho, our road to the deep north and other travel sketches. And we come to page 14. Note in the above how that poem of Segi's, how his poem takes up the suggestion of the preceding poem and yet opens a new world of its own so that the reader is carried through the whole series as though the exquisitely arranged rooms of a building always entertained by delightful changes but never arrested by sudden contradiction. It is no longer a witty association or verbal play, but something in the depths of the human heart that combines these poems. I think it is particularly significant from our point of view that already in the times of Soji, the starting piece, Hoku, or of a series which was always written in the five, seven, five syllable form was given a special place and composed only by the most experienced poets. At least two things were considered essential to the starting piece. First, a reference to the season in which it is written, and second, the existence of the so-called breaking word. You see, they have, they have the season, so they say it by spring or it's autumn, and then there's the so-called breaking word, the kariji, or a short emotionally charged word by arresting the flow of the poetic statement for a moment gives extra strength and dignity. These are restrictions that bind the later haiku together. So they have some sort of breaking word. Towards the end of the Muromaki period and in the early part of the Edo period, 1603 to 1866, length verse of a lower order, or Haikei, no renga, which continued to be written in the preceding age, merely as a kind of reconstructed recreative pastime, gained enormous popularity. This is, of course, partly due to the over refinement and elaboration of Siri's poetry, but mainly because uh, freedom and open laughter, which is characteristic which characterized length verse of a lower order suited the taste of the merchant class, which was then rising throughout the country. And the earliest innovators are Sokan, S-O-K-A-N, and Mar Marataki, 1773 to 1849. Let us quote here some well, their poems or haiku to give a glimpse of their poetic world. In a perfect circle rises the spring day, but it gains an enormous length by the time it sinks. To the moon in the sky, if you put a handle, it will certainly be an excellent fan. A hanging willow in beautiful green paints eyebrows on the brow of a cliff. Not in the flower, but rather in the nose. The snow is dyed so it seems to me. Even in the technique of linking, they seem to have almost gone back to the playful mood of the poets of the Union period, for example. I wanted not poem I wanted not yet not quite wanted to use my sword to kill a man. 
capturing the thief, I was surprised to find him, none but my own son. Or again, poem lighter than paper, plum blossoms are sent flying from the holy compound on a spring day, unwilling, it seems, to fall behind. Crows and bush wobblers fly about. The witticism of Sokan and Morikaki was carried a step further to a bold and con conscious acceptance of colloquialism by T. Toku, 1571-1653. He, it was, who first stated explicitly that length verse of the lower order had an artistic merit peculiar to itself, and that it, being the voice of the happy people, did not hesitate to use any popular terminology, hokan, available to provoke healthy laughter. What actually happened in this poetry, however, was somewhat different from what he proposed to do in his theoretical statements, where he did everything so consciously, so calculating, almost by rule and measure. For example, Om. Wonderful coolness is packed, intact in the limpish moon of a summer evening. No bigger than a fist, it seems, the clouds that brought the shower. The length verse happens to be fairly good poetry, but if one looks at it closely, one realizes that the length is provided by an elaborate net of verbal associations. Limp, fist, evening, shower. Basho criticized this kind of linking technique as being mechanical. Mono suki. Well, carried to an extreme, it often leads to the impoverishment of poetry. The same tendency can be detected in Titoku's haiku. Home. Dumplings rather than flowers, they seem to strew those wild geese flying home to the north. The year of the tiger has come, even the spring mist rises in spots and stripes. What? What? Tukoku intended but did not quite succeed in doing was achieved by Soyan, S O I N, 1605-80, and his disciples, particularly Sakaku, and among them. I think it is significant that both Soyan and Sakaku chose as the center of their activity Osaka, the city where the power of the merchant class was strongest. In the poems of Titoku, as we have seen, the language was often colloquial enough that the descriptive, depicted scenes themselves are not greatly different from the elegant scenes themselves were not greatly different from the elegant scenes of serious poetry. In the poems of Soyan and Sakaku, however, all the events of this Floating world are recorded with absolute freedom in cheerful rhyme and truly popular idiom. To quote some of their hoku, long rain of May, the whole world is a single sheet of paper under the clouds. There's more poetry. Exactly in the shape of a letter in the Dutch alphabet lies in the sky a band of wild geese. Saying, she, 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 my wife encourages the baby to pass water. I hear the noise of a morning shower. Walking in a desolate field, I picked up a woman's comb. She must have came come here to pluck flowers in spring.
Doyan and his disciples insisted that the real merit of their poetry was in metaphor, Kuken, that is, saying one thing and meaning another. This is an idea that was later developed by Basho into the more significant theory of substance, Jitsu and essence, Kyo in poetry. As interpreted by the So, so Young and his disciples, however, metaphor meant simply bringing together two things of different categories by ingenuity. For example, a morning shower and its u urination in the third poem quoted above, the same kind of continuous swipe can be detected in linking the linking technique. Thus gathered in a company we had in the midst of us, a tree of laughter and talk, a fragrant plum tree, the piercing voice of a bush wobbler is an alarm for the slumbering world. On a misty morning, a line of smoke from my pipe is broken sideways. Falcon bearers have passed. There arose a blast of mountain wind. Here, is the, here the links are provided by a clever interpretation and ingenious transfer, what Basho called Kokorosuki. It was certainly an improvement over the mechanical linking technique of Kitoku because it opened a new world of poetry by giving a freer play to the human mind. There was, however, something vitally important lacking in the poetry of Soyan and his disciples, as is amply testified by the inferior work, which almost degenerated into nonsense verse. Just when people became aware of this, when poets like Gansu, 1650, 1722, and Anna Tutsura, 1661, 1738, were making their efforts to save poetry from vulgarity, our master, Matsuyo Basho, 1644 to 1694, employed his great genius to lift haiku once and for all into the realm of perfect poetry. Poetry that embodies in itself at once the seriousness and elegance of Soju and the freedom and the energy of Soyan, indeed poetry that is worth reading hundreds of years after his death. And for that matter, at any time in human history. That's the end of the second section. The second part of the introduction. <laughs> well, that's page 19. What do you, do you have any commentary, comments on that? Read the, the perfect poetry part. Goodness gracious. Okay, I'll end it at the closing line. This one of people are aware of, were making their efforts to save poetry from vulgarity. Our master, Matsui Basho, employed his great genius to lift haiku once and for all into the realm of perfect poetry and poetry that embody in itself at once the seriousness and elegance of Soju and the freedom and energy of Soyan, indeed poetry that is worth reading hundreds of years after his death or for that matter at any time in human history. Wow, that's pretty heavy. 